There's an ancient Chinese curse that we've all heard of, which is may you live in interesting times, and certainly the uh, last uh, few days in Britain, anyway, have been very interesting times, um, and very difficult times, particularly for what we used to call, I should say, the three main parties, um, Labour, uh, Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats. Uh, but, of course, um, one man's curse... Uh, is another man's blessing and uh, that man is clearly Nigel Farage. So I thought I'd say a little bit about um, uh, what the results mean for UKIP over the next year, then I'll talk a little bit about the Lib Dems and Labour and the Conservatives and then say something a little bit more uh, general. So uh, for UKIP, uh, if you're not aware of it, um, this was uh, a triumph. Uh, the European elections uh, and indeed the local elections at the Europeans uh, Nigel Farage's party got 27% of the vote and topped the poll. Um, Labour coming in just behind them on 25% and the Conservatives just behind them on 24%. Uh, Greens with 8% and the Liberal Democrats below the Greens, so in fifth place uh, in a national election, on 7%. Um, clearly, as I said, this was a great result for UKIP, uh, especially after... Uh, the party had suffered, particularly in the last week or so, an onslaught on the part of previously quite friendly media outlets. Uh, it was very interesting in the, the run-up um, to polling day on the Thursday how uh, newspapers, which generally speaking have made quite a lot um, of the EU issue uh, from an anti-position and from uh, about immigration from an anti-perspective, uh, actually turned on Nigel Farage and his party and uh, accused the party of being racist um, without very much difficulty because, of course, they could always find candidates, uh, councillors, etc., who had said um, some very, very stupid things. And indeed, Nigel Farage himself um, got into trouble for um, talking about uh, Romanians moving in next door. Um, and yet, despite this, or some people might say actually because of this in some ways, um, UKIP still managed... Um, to top the poll. Arguably, um, and I'll say something about this later, um, some of the media attention and spotlight shone on Nigel Farage and his party, however critical, actually helped him simply because um, they made uh, UKIP very much a, a talking point and brought them to the top, if you like, of, electro of the electorate's head. Um, so, if we look at that result and we combine it with the um, performance of the party in local elections and we also take into account a big um, mega poll of marginal seats that was done by Lord Ashcroft who's a Conservative peer in the UK who's recently got um, into, into polling uh, big time um, we can see that the, the next year really for UKIP will probably be about it um, deciding which Westminster seats it is going to target um, it seriously believes, and I'm not sure actually that it's completely fanciful, um, that it can win seats in a first-past-the-post general election. Um, most obviously it needs to target the seat uh, that Nigel Farage himself will stand in. Um, probably it will be in Kent and it will probably be Thanet South. Um, that seems to, uh, according to the Lord Ashcross polling anyway, now be a three-way marginal um, that Labour could win. Uh, UKIP could win, or indeed the Conservatives could win, and the sitting Conservative MP, uh, a Euro-friendly uh, woman, is actually standing down after just one term uh, in there. So um, look out for Thanet South, I would say. There is, of course, the prospect that the Conservatives could, although I still think this is unlikely, but it's possible, um, could win a seat in a by-election um, coming up very soon in Newark in Nottinghamshire. Um, if they were to do that, then that would clearly, I think, give them more momentum for Westminster uh, at the general election. The question for UKIP though, over the next year, really, is can they maintain um, the momentum that the results over the weekend um, have given them? Uh, there are some problems in doing that. The first one is that they are still extremely reliant on Nigel Farage. And Nigel Farage clearly... Um, is an incredible campaigner, but he is only one man. And there were signs, um, both in public and in private, towards the end of the campaign um, last week, that uh, he was beginning to tire, was beginning to fray. This is not necessarily a particularly um, robust 
uh, individual, although clearly his public persona is, you know, um, all smoking, all drinking man. Uh, this is a guy who was nearly killed in an airplane crash uh, at the last election uh, and cannot, I think, maintain the kind of um, media um, profile that he maintained over the last four weeks over the course of the next year. And he has himself said that he's going to be stepping back um, and hopefully um, allowing others to do some of UKIP's talking for it. But it's not immediately apparent who those people will be. It may be that some of the MEPs who have been elected um, will be able to do that job for him. Uh, his economic spokesman is supposed to be a man of some talent. Uh, the party chairman, Steve Crowver, is actually very good on the media. Um, I had several people ask me after seeing him on television, who is that guy? He's not bonkers. Um, so he's clearly got something that a lot of UKIP um, people have not got. I'd met him and he's, a, you know, actually comes over as a very nice guy. So if they were to use him more, he's a candidate in North Devon. Um, that might be a good idea uh, as well. But talking of candidates and talking of MEPs, um, of course, there is also a downside risk from these people in that they will do and say things that expose the party to uh, ridicule or even bring it into disrepute. Having said that, however, that's what a lot of people said coming into this election, and uh, UKIP did not seem to suffer. Um, the more candidates or councillors were exposed as being um, racist or you know just plain um, idiots, uh, it didn't really... Um, seem to, to matter a great deal to uh, UKIP and uh, the view that was held of it by those people who wanted to vote for it anyway. The other uh, vulnerability UKIP have got is clearly policy. Um, they haven't got any. Now in some ways this is good um, because <laughs> you can't be attacked but there must presumably, um, unless they defy all um, laws that apply to, to most political parties, there must come a point at which they do have to get some uh, policies and defend them. Uh, Farage has completely disowned the 2010 manifesto, um, but he has acknowledged himself that you know UKIP does need to build uh, and construct a policy platform for next time around. That could be problematic because once the electorate is confronted with some of UKIP's policies, which are uh, towards the neoliberal end of things, and uh, in particular are much more sceptical about the value of things like the health service, the minimum wage, etc., that, that actually have a lot of support uh, among people who would otherwise vote for UKIP, um, that might cause them um, to, to come unstuck. Um, the other thing that UKIP has to do is to decide on its attitude to some kind of deal with the Conservatives. Now, this won't be a national pact, if you like, but there may be a series of local agreements... Uh, and we've already heard noises from UKIP, um, both in the last election and since then, um, about the idea that they will stand down or not stand candidates in um, constituencies of which the Conservative MP uh, declares himself publicly to want to leave the European Union. Now, actually, the number of Conservative MPs who are publicly signed up to this better off out um, stance is very very small. You can literally count them on the hands on, on the fingers of, of two hands. It's about ten. Um, but it could be that more conservatives, particularly in marginal seats, may declare themselves as such if they feel that it will help them um, uh, uh, by preventing UKIP from standing. Um, Farage though is still, um, I think. Um, speaking out of both sides of his mouth on, on that particular issue but we'll see if, if any kind of commitment hardens up so that's UKIP but I will return to UKIP because obviously they're the big story um, in terms of the big losers of the um, past few days uh, then they are clearly um, the Liberal Democrats now why have they lost so much support I think it's just the ongoing logical consequence of their decision to enter what was uh, counterintuitive coalition with the Conservative Party in 2010. Um, I think it would have been perfectly feasible for the Liberal Democrats to enter that coalition had they not campaigned for um, uh, years prior to that general election as a party somewhat to the left of New Labour. Um, the problem for them was that they did that and therefore the, the um, coalition with the Conservatives, while it made perfect sense 
for people like Nick Clegg and David Laws and Orange Book liberals, market-friendly liberals, if you like, it didn't really make sense to a lot of people uh, who voted Liberal Democrat in the electorate and for a lot of people who um, were actually Lib Dem uh, activists, although many of them have been prepared to give Clegg the benefit of the doubt until now, possibly. Um, the other problem, of course, is not only the joining of that coalition, but actually how the Liberal Democrats have behaved in that coalition. Um, they have been seen by their um, most vociferous supporters on the centre-left and by a lot of the electorate as a bit of a pushover for the Conservatives. In other words, there aren't that many things that you can point to, particularly when it comes to you know, the economic programme of the government, where the Conservative Party has not been able to get its way. Um, and I think that has uh, gradually... Um, uh, told on Liberal Democrat um, support. Now Nick Clegg, as you've probably heard, has um, come under uh, quite a bit of pressure over the last um, day or two. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I uh, am on Twitter, uh, and I, I tweeted yesterday, breaking news, Deputy Prime Minister <coughs> resigns in Ireland. Okay, but uh, that got quite a lot of retweets. Uh, presumably some people just read the first few lines and believed that it was, in fact possible or had come to pass. Actually, um, he probably will survive. Uh, that seems to be the kind of common wisdom. Um, why is that the case? Well, a number of reasons. I, I think um, there is, uh, although there shouldn't be, a kind of talismanic, totemic difference between getting one seat uh, in an election, which is what the Liberal Democrats did, and getting no seats whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> It's absolutely ridiculous, but I do think that that, that does make a psychological difference. Uh, more importantly, however, is the fact that I think the, the strategy for the Liberal Democrats, which is basically keep calm, carry on, we will eventually get our reward for acting responsibly uh, in 2010, bringing stability to the country, bringing eventually uh, economic growth to the country. I, I think that strategy is, is set in stone, and I, I think that most Liberal Democrats in my view, naively, still believe that in the end it could um, pay off. Other reasons why he might survive, well, who wants to take over um, that party before what looks like it could be uh, a, a quite bad defeat? Uh, and anyway, you run the risk of, of looking as though you behave treacherously. Much better if you're interested in leading the party, and there are a fair few people interested in leaving, leading the party, believe it or not, still, um, much better to wait till after the election, I think, um, to, make, to make your move. Also, one has to ask, what would be the point of replacing Nick Clegg if the party still intends to stay in coalition with the Conservatives? <coughs> Uh, there, it seems to me um, you know, illogical, really, to, to replace the man who is the symbol of your intention to stay the course and then say you're going to stay the course. So I, I think, I think he's, he's logically, anyway, probably um, safe. What the Liberal Democrats are destined to do then is sort of grind out the next year, basically, trying to differentiate from the Conservative Party as much as possible when they can and reminding public of the public of, of the achievements that they consider uh, are theirs, um, of which there are, one could argue, um, precious few, and certainly precious few that the public identify with them rather than with the Conservatives more generally. For example, um, reductions in, in um, taxation for people on, on lower incomes. Um, I think their problem, however, is going to be and it's a problem they've had all the time, they don't control any big portfolios. They made the decision that it would be wise not to get, get any of the big jobs in government to have instead the Deputy Prime Ministerial job and uh, uh, Chief Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, and I think that has been a disaster. But you, know, you, you live and learn, and perhaps if they go into coalition another time, they won't make that mistake again. Whether they will face a wipeout at the general election, I think, is, a, is, a, is doubtful. Um, Liberal Democrats uh, tend to do better when they are incumbents. They tend to dig in quite well, and it's perfectly possible that even on just around sort of ten, you know, uh, percent of the vote, they might still retain sort of twenty-five, thirty seats. I wouldn't absolutely bet on that, but I think they're fairly confident that it won't be a complete kind of meltdown um, situation for them in the general election, like it almost was in, in the European election. So moving on to Labour then. Well, Labour, I think, are very disheartened. If you talk to people in the Labour camp at the moment, they're very disappointed with the um, elections. But in some ways, the, the elections, both the local elections and the um, European elections, didn't really um, tell Labour 
uh, anything it didn't know or at least fear uh, already really um, uh, and what was that? Well, uh, UKIP appeals to some uh, of the so-called left-behind voters, white working class people, uh, normally men without much education, um, who feel the country's been going in the wrong direction since, you know, maybe the 1950s even, uh, and would in some ways, you know, like the world to, to stop so they can get off. Um, everybody knew that. But I think the extent to which it was actually going to eat into Labour's vote was perhaps underestimated. So maybe there's a bit more concern about that uh, now than, than there was before. Labour clearly knows from the polling that's been done around the election that it's not trusted yet on the economy. Um, uh, it also uh, knows that its leader is not only um, not inspiring um, to voters, but is actually off-putting uh, to large swathes um, of the electorate. It knows it still has um, difficulty in winning seats uh, in the um, south of England, which is problematic because, of course, there are a lot of seats there. But it knows that it has London as this oasis, if you like, in the desert. Um, and it's very interesting if you compare um, the uh, situation in uh, Britain with the situation in Ireland, our populist party, UKIP, um, comes nowhere in, in, in the big cities. Okay? Where it does best is in you know, the small towns or the smaller cities out in the sticks, which is a complete kind of reversal in some ways, um, you, you can argue, as Sinn Féin has this ability to pick up seats in, in Dublin. Um, but but um, you know, uh, the populist equivalent we have, although it will be on the right rather than the left, doesn't manage to do that in, in, in Britain. Um, London seems to be a kind of UKIP free zone uh, at the moment. So does all this mean that Ed Miliband is in trouble? Probably not. He's probably safe, um, partly because it's institutionally extremely difficult to unseat a Labour leader, partly because it's culturally very difficult for the Labour Party to do that. It has a history of not getting rid of leaders, uh, as we know. Um, from uh, 2007 to 2010 where most people knew that Gordon Brown was leading the party to a complete disaster uh, and yet uh, were unwilling um, sadly for David Miliband to um, plunge the knife into his back uh, and do something about it if parties were rational actors which they're not, the Labour Party um, may well um, try and dump him if they could find someone who was willing to take on the job uh, or, or someone who was um, capable of taking on the job and there, there may well be someone like Yvette Cooper current Shadow Home Secretary um, I, I think some people would agree would, would make a good job of it um, however you know, whether she's willing to do it is another matter so I, I think they'll, they'll stick with Ed Miliband and Ed Miliband can argue I think reasonably justifiably that he, he has made some good calls in some important uh, issues over the last uh, few years but uh, the other reason is because Labour still because of the quirks of the electoral system and because it is actually running quite good organisation on the ground still has a serious chance of finishing up as the largest party after the next election there is this electoral bias in Britain which means that the Conservative Party still has to be at least 6-7 percentage points ahead of Labour um, in an election to win an overall majority and there was some hope over the weekend for Labour because of this big poll of marginal seats conducted by Lord Ashcroft, which showed Labour would, if an election were held tomorrow, would take 83 seats from the Conservatives. They still seem to be ahead, uh, more ahead in marginal seats than they are more generally. So, um, beginning to wind up now on the Conservatives. Um, well, the Conservatives have done an absolutely brilliant job of spinning the results of these elections. All credit to them. It, it seems as if almost they are the winners, um, uh, apart from UKIP. Actually, these results are very worrying for the Conservative Party. Um, yes, they do show that UKIP is kind of nibbling into to the Labour vote as well. Um, but um, it is still, I think, true to say... Um, that in all probability um, UKIP doing well at a general election would have more effect on the Conservative vote than it would have on the Labour vote. Uh, or if not the vote, then on the Conservatives' seats. It's an indirect effect in that it's not as if UKIP will actually take any or many seats from the Conservatives, but what UKIP will do in you know, perhaps up to 20 marginal seats is actually prevent the Conservatives from winning or even cause them to lose by taking some votes away from a Conservative candidate and giving them to um, uh, UKIP and therefore allowing Labour to come through um, the middle. Now, at the moment, 
um, UKIP in opinion polls are around 14%. So they did 27% of the Euro elections, but um, I, I would caution against, and you all know this anyway, taking Euro election results and extrapolating to what people would do in a general election. If you ask people what they would do in a general election tomorrow, UKIP are on around 14%. Now, if the Conservatives cannot squeeze UKIP down, and Labour to some extent too, cannot squeeze um, UKIP down to beneath double figures, in other words under 10%, then they are in big trouble. Um, it is very likely uh, that the UKIP, if they get over 10%, will be causing the Conservatives um, either to lose seats to Labour in marginal um, constituencies or perhaps uh, just simply prevent them from winning seats. Um, from from Labour as well. Um, so, if you if you look uh, at opinion polls and ask people, well, okay, you voted UKIP in the European elections or the local elections, how likely are you to carry on voting UKIP uh, in the general election next year? There are two answers to this. One is the British election study recently uh, published um, results on this. Sixty five percent of people who say they are uh, they they they're voting for UKIP say they're going to vote for UKIP in a general election um, in a year's time. So if you, if you say 14%, 65% of that is 9.1%. That's still in risky territory for the Conservatives. Ashcroft polling shows slightly fewer. That gets UKIP down to 6.3% in the general election, which would be just about manageable for the Conservatives. So the Conservatives, I think, <clears throat> shouldn't panic, but they should be concerned. So how best do they respond? talking of panic. Um, well, the most obvious, the most tempting way for the Conservative Party to respond is probably the worst um, thing they can do, and that is to shift towards UKIP, harden their policies and harden their rhetoric on uh, the EU and on um, uh, immigration in particular. Why is that a mistake? Well, A, it's difficult to see what more the Conservatives could do in this direction that's um, consonant with their international obligations. Um, B, it would look opportunistic um, and probably inauthentic, given that Cameron still has this kind of liberal conservative image about him. Um, C, it would crowd out the... Um, uh, main card that the Conservatives should be playing, which is the economy, and D, it's electorally risky as well, um, because it will put off um, well-heeled, well-educated AB voters, if you like, that the Conservative need to hold on to and risk losing. Uh, and secondly, it would actually, I think, only end up driving those issues up the media and public agenda making them more salient and therefore actually doing UKIP a favour. In other words, the more that the EU, the more that immigration in particular is in play, the better UKIP is going to do. So for the Conservatives to actually increase the salience of those issues, I think would be um, not necessarily suicidal, but, but, but a mistake. Um, having said that, of course, um, Cameron is going to come under a huge amount of pressure uh, to do precisely this, both from some of his MPs and um, from uh, what I would call the party in the media uh, in, in Britain. And of course, uh, Labour may well make the same mistake. Um, there are a lot of Labour people saying now that they have to talk more about immigration. Um, I don't think Labour will sell the pass on uh, its promise uh, not to hold an in-out <coughs> referendum uh, yet, but I think uh, the Labour Party are sorely tempted uh, to talk a little bit more immigration to, uh, about immigration to shore up uh, as they see it, their support in some of their um, their core uh, areas. So, uh, in conclusion, I think it's going to be um, quite a nasty year in British politics. Um, I think we are going to see uh, quite a xenophobic um, campaign waged on, on all sides, possibly. We're certainly going to see quite a lot of personal attacks, particularly on the Labour leader, um, Ed Miliband from the Conservatives who they regard um, as a, a Trump card if you like uh, and so what about the results well I know it's a kind of mugs game um, to predict but it would be a little bit unfair to come here and um, say all this without um, giving you at least my, my guess on what's going to happen if you look at the fundamentals I think we can say this it's extremely difficult for incumbent governments in the UK to increase um, their vote share um, from one general election to another. It's possible, but it's um, 
difficult to do, particularly when real wages have been under such pressure for so long. On the other hand, it's difficult for an opposition in Britain to turn things around after just one term. Again, it's possible, but it's very difficult. It's especially difficult um, for an opposition which is not trusted as much as the government on the economy and which has a leader who is ranked uh, far uh, more poorly than uh, the Prime Minister himself. So the logical conclusion, especially when you add in the fact that um, you know, the long-term share of the vote taken by the two biggest parties has been declining over time, you look at the fact that the Liberal Democrats are going nowhere but UKIP uh, are, are coming up, I think the logical conclusion is we will have another hung parliament uh, and that uh, the Conservatives will probably, but Labour possibly be, um, the largest party in that hung parliament with the Liberal Democrats still in there and possibly um, one or maybe even more um, UKIP uh, MPs. That's my best guess, but you have, uh, of course, uh, time now uh, to uh, argue against that and give your own views. Thank you. Thank you very much.